We come to Paul, Paul's theology. Paul's a missionary, right? Paul's not first a theologian. He's not even really first a pastor. He's, he, he's a missionary. And especially academic people, often academic people forget to take into account that Paul, Paul was a missionary. You know, Paul uh, was, it must have had an, um, he must have been amazingly strong physically. I mean, I think he struggled from some sickness, but you think of the amount he traveled, and five times he was beaten with rods, and uh, God must have made him as an incredibly strong person physically to do, to do all that he did. So um, I, I want to recommend to you Paul, uh, Bob Yarbrough, who has, Bob's been out here, I think, hasn't he? And taught out here? Yeah, Bob is writing a commentary on the pastoral epistles, and, that I, and I saw it pre-publication, and he has a great section there on work. And he really emphasizes in this section how pastors are called to work hard. Obviously, we need times of rest, but it's, and he, and he uses Paul as an example of how, how we, need to, we need to labor. That's, that's, uh, that's part of what it means to be, to be a pastor and to be a, work, a worker in God's uh, kingdom. Anyway, we see that the, the kingdom, God, Paul's kingdom work is expressed in a number of ways. Planting, so here's this missionary work, right? Planting uh, the church, laying a foundation. That's just another way of saying the, the, the church is established, right? He planted a church, that's, a, that's an agricultural metaphor. He laid a, the foundation of the church, that's an architectural metaphor. He, he gave birth to the church, so to speak, obviously a biological metaphor. Uh, he, he betrothed the church, uh, a uh, marriage metaphor. So he uses different metaphors to describe what it means for him to, to establish uh, the church. Then when we think of our story as a whole, we think of the promise of Abraham, right? That's, we've gone from the promise to the woman to the promise to Abraham to the promise to David, the fulfillment of the new covenant, and, and, of course, that's all over Paul as well. We're not surprised, are we? That Paul, Paul sees his gospel, his good news, as a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And that, that's clear from all the times he cites the Old Testament. He, he sees his, his gospel as the second exodus. I'll, I'll show you an example. Galatians 1.4. Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. That language of rescuing is the language of the Exodus, right? The language of rescuing is the language of freedom, of, of liberation. So the, the second Exodus, the new Exodus, is common Jesus, and it's based on his death. It's based on his uh, giving of his life for us. So the promises are, have come to pass, and we see, this is something I've talked about many times in this class already. Paul argues that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Who, who is the true seed? Who is the true offspring of Abraham? Who's the two, true child of Abraham? Well, we learn from the Old Testament it's going to be a king. It's going to be a king in David's line. But we saw all those kings failed, didn't they? As, as some of them were very godly, like David. Or we think of Josiah or Hezekiah. But all of them were sinners. Paul's argument when he says Jesus is the one true son of Abraham, I think Paul's argument is this. The only true son of God at the end of the day has to be a son of God who always obeyed him, who never sinned. So, so if you're going to be part of Abraham's family, if you're going to be a child of Abraham, you've got to belong to Jesus. And, we, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, every believer is a child of Abraham, according to Paul. Galatians 3, Romans 4, you're familiar with those passages? Those who have faith, those who have faith are the sons of Abraham, the children of Abraham. Romans 4, Abraham is the father of the circumcised who believe, Jewish believers. 
Abraham is also the father of Gentiles who believe, uncircumcised, since Abraham was a believer before he was circumcised. So both the circumcised and uncircumcised, both Jew and Gentile. So Romans 2, 25. Circumcision benefits if you observe the law, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. I think what we see in Romans 2 is what Paul typically preached, among other things, when he went in the synagogues. He went in the synagogues, and he preached the gospel, but he also wanted to show Jews who did not believe in Jesus that they were sinners. They were counting on their circumcision as a covenant sign. They, they thought, we're circumcised, we belong to the covenant. Paul says, if you're a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. That is, you're outside the covenant, right? If an uncircumcised person keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? If an uncircumcised person keeps the law, won't he be considered to be a covenant member, even though he's uncircumcised? Now, what would a Jew say about that verse? Wait a minute. Circumcision is part of the law. <laughs> Wait, this is... Well, Paul has this idea of keeping the law without being circumcised, but he means what he says, doesn't he? Circumcision isn't important to Paul anymore. A man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. So that's clearly the Gentile again, the Gentile who keeps the law. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Is this obedience hypothetical of the uncircumcised or actual? If it's hypothetical, so Doug Moo, for example, for whom I have enormous respect. I, love, I mean, Doug's a friend, but also an incredible interpreter of Scripture. Doug and others say the obedience described here isn't a real obedience, but a hypothetical obedience, since, since the point of this whole section is all are sinners and need to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus to be saved. Makes sense. However, I think Paul's doing something a little different here. So Doug and I have a little bit of a disagreement here. I think Paul is speaking of an obedience that is genuine here, that he's not speaking hypothetically. And my main reason is verses 28 and 29. And the four in Greek agar that connects this paragraph. So see what you think. Make up your own mind. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true, circum true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. So Jewishness and circumcision aren't... Jewishness is not, Paul saying, fundamentally an ethnic matter, right? It's not outward. True circumcision is not something that's a physical operation. On the contrary, a a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart. Now, here, here's why I disagree with Moo. By the Spirit, not the letter. He, he talks here about the work of the Spirit. How do you become a true Jew? How do you become truly circumcised? You, you become a true Jew and truly circumcised by the work of the Spirit. Hence, the obedience Paul is talking about here is not an obedience that merits or earns salvation, but is a result and consequence of the Spirit's work in your life. And he's saying, he's saying those, those who have the Spirit's work in their life, even if they're uncircumcised and even if, even if they're not Jews, they're the true Jews. They're spiritual Jews. They're, they're the true circumcision. Why would Paul put that in Romans 2? Because he's trying to motivate Jews to repent, and he's saying, 
don't you see Gentiles who have repented and believed in Jesus and received the Spirit? They're experiencing the blessings you're supposed to have. <laughs> Romans 9, 10 and 11, he's trying to motivate them to jealousy, right? A good kind of jealousy. It's like, you know, the illustration I'd use is, you know, the, the adopted son comes in and uh, warms up to the parents and uh, loves the parents, enjoys the parents' fellowship, and the biological son runs away from the parents. And the biological son looks and says, look at all the love the adopted son's getting. I can have that love if I just come back in the family. That's what I think John's saying. Look, I mean, I mean Paul, look, come back in. Come back in. So I think it fits the argument. So for Paul, Gentiles, you know, are, are we the true Israel? Are we the spiritual Israel, believers in Jesus Christ? Yes, we are. I mean, Paul says it right here. That doesn't mean that there's not a future for ethnic Israel. It doesn't have to be. I don't think it is an either or. So I believe that Romans 11 Verse 26 is speaking of a future salvation of ethnic Israel. All Israel shall be saved. I think in that context, it's clear that Israel is ethnic, uh, not, not spiritual. So context is king. Paul, there are passages where Paul can say the church, those who are believers are true Jews and the true Israel. But he also can say, and I think he also teaches, there will be an eschatological future salvation of ethnic Israel, I understand that to take place. People understand this differently, but I understand that to take, take place nearer at the second coming. Of course, all Jews who believe now, there's ethnic Jews who believe now, are part of the spiritual Israel as well. Any, any Jew who believes is part of the, part of the true Israel as well. Um, so, in Ephesians, I'll come back to Galatians 6, 6. 6, 16, but Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, we see that Jews and Gentiles together, Gentiles used to be excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, but now they've been brought near by Christ's blood. Now the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles has been torn down. Now they're reconciled both to God in one body. They're part of the church together. We both have access. They're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints. They're members of God's household. The mystery that's been revealed, right? The mystery that's been revealed, chapter 3, is that now Jews and Gentiles together are co-heirs, members of the same body. So the mystery that's been revealed is there's one people of God, Jew and Gentile together, in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, that's the promise to Abraham, isn't it? All nations will be blessed through you. That promise is being fulfilled in the church of Jesus Christ as Jews and Gentiles come together. So what does it mean to be a Christian? You're the true circumcision, right? Philippians 3.3. 3. Who is the true circumcision? Those who worship in the Spirit of God. Not, it's not the physical operation. Who are the true Jews? Not those who are ethnic Jews. Those who are the true Jews are those who've had the work of the Spirit in their hearts. That's Jew and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. Who are the children of Abraham? Galatians. Are those who have faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be an ethnic son of Abraham to be a child of Abraham. So, so I... I think in Galatians 6.16, this is a very disputed verse, when Paul talks about the Israel of God, he has in mind the church, Jew and Gentile together. The grammar could go either way. There's a lot of arguments on the grammar. The chi could be ascensive or uh, it could be conjunctive. But the reason I think he's talking about the Israel of God, it's the point of the whole book. The point of the, the Judaizers have come in and they've said, look, you need to be circumcised. You basically need to be a Jew. You know, if you're circumcised, you're converted to Judaism. You had to be circumcised to be a proselyte. You're all familiar with that, right? That's the mainstream view in Judaism. To be a proselyte, you have to be circumcised. That's what the Judaizers are saying. 
You have to be circumcised to be a proselyte. You, so if you want to be a child of Abraham, the opponents are saying, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to become a Jew. Paul strikes back and says, no, that's not right. The only circumcision you need is the cross. <laughs> the only cutting off you need is the cross of Christ. You don't need any other circumcision. If righteousness came through the law, then Christ died for nothing. If righteousness comes through circumcision, Christ dies for nothing. No, you don't need circumcision. You, you need the cross. What do you need to be a child of Abraham, right? A tr- a Jew, true Jew, everybody who gets in is a child of Abraham. You need faith in Jesus Christ. At the end of the book, the last paragraph, he rings the chains on everything he said in the book. And I think it'd be terribly confusing at the end of the book if Paul were to say, well, the Israel of God is Jewish. His whole point in the book is all those who believe are children of Abraham. So that I think he's saying at the end of the book, you're the Israel of God because right? It's the new creation has come. You see that? Well, maybe we should see that because it's in the text because they're bound together. Paul's argument is, right? See, the opponents, they want you to be circumcised. Verses 12 and 13. Verse 14. But Paul says, that's the old world. Circumcision was required as long as the old creation lasted, right? Genesis 17 says that covenant is an everlasting covenant, the covenant in your flesh. You remember that? You with me? So you think, what did the opponents say in Galatia? What did they say? They said, you got to keep my covenant. What's the covenant? You got to be circumcised. Oh, it's spiritual circumcision. Nope. The flesh of your foreskin. Can't get around that one, right? Physical circumcision. How long throughout your generations? That's a long time. Forever. How about foreigners? Yeah, foreigners too. It's an everlasting and permanent covenant. Everlasting. How can Paul get off and saying an everlasting covenant doesn't, isn't, isn't in force anymore? Paul's argument is, yeah, as long as the old creation lasted, but the new creation's come. Yes, there's an already now, yeah, yes, there's an overlap, but once the new creation comes, the old creation's gone. So that's his argument, right? The world has been crucified to me through the cross. The cross and the resurrection have introduced a new world. So I argue in Galatians, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He could have ended the letter right there. He's won the argument. The circumcision required? No, Jesus was raised from the dead. Like, what? The new creations come. When the resurrection arrives in the history, the new creation has arrived. And once the new creation has arrived, circumcision's gone. It's no longer required. And am I making it up? I'm not making it up. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters is the new creation. There it is. The new creation's come. It's inaugurated. So the Israel of God is drawn around the new creation now, not the old creation. So Paul uses these terms of the church, ecclesia, which comes from kahal, Holy, elect, beloved, called. Those are all Israel's terms. That's what Israel's called in the Old Testament. He's saying, now this is true of you. That's why he asks in Romans 9, have God's promises to Israel, are they not going to come to pass? I mean, since it's all being fulfilled in the church, is there no future salvation for ethnic Israel? And, of course, we know his answer. There is a future salvation. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah. So yeah, just following along with just where you were just mentioning about, you know, uh, in Romans, and he's talking about Jews and Gentiles and their relationship, and now these blessings are upon the Gentiles, and it's going to make the Jews jealous, but there's still at the end, you know, this, this ethnic remnant, you know, that it's going to be saved, the Jews. Um, so he, if he ends there in Romans with the, the future for ethnic Israel, then it seems like it's not, you know, a stretch to think that he's ending in Galatians with peace be upon the Israel of God referring to a 
future believing national Israel? It's possible. It's certainly possible, but I would argue the contexts are so different. In Romans 9 through 11, over and over and over again, it's clear that the term Israel refers to ethnic Israel, right? But I'd argue Galatians is going the other way. Galatians is written to a, a particular situation where the opponents are saying, you've got to be Jews to be part of the people of God. So Paul doesn't want to end the letter by saying something like that. It'd be confusing. Whereas in Romans, he's just going a different direction. However, lots of good people disagree with me. So, you know, it's possible. It's certainly possible. But that's not the way I would go. Yeah. No, I guess that's not a question. You're just scratching. Yeah. Anything else you want to say in there? Comments, questions? OK. Um, so we think of Paul, Paul's ministry, Paul's suffering. Um, so many things we could say here, but the fundamental sin in Paul's theology, right? The fundamental sin is uh, the refusal to honor and to praise God. They did not honor God and give him thanks. They worshiped a creature rather than the creator. So that's, that's very fundamental for Paul's worldview, isn't it? We think of sin in our culture as doing wrong things. And of course it is that. But that, Paul argues, is the consequence of the fundamental sin. All of that is the result. The real sin is de-godding God. The, the fundamental sin from which all other sins flow is I can make it in life without God. So, you know, I thought of this when we lived in, we lived in Minnesota. Our next door neighbor who was Jewish, but she was Reformed Jew. Do you know what that means? AKA liberal. <laughs> Reformed Jews are like liberal Protestants. You know, they go to church on Christmas and Easter. I mean, they go to synagogue. <laughs> on Yom Kippur and Passover, that sort of thing, right? Then that's basically what she did. She, she married a Catholic, so, you know. But she'd still say she was Jewish, you know. And uh, she, was, she was, besides my wife, the nicest person maybe I've ever known. She was so nice. I mean, we just loved her. And my wife, especially, had so many opportunities to witness to her. I mean, if you'd look at her, you'd think, well, does, she, does she really need Jesus? She's a lot, not, a lot nicer than a lot of Christians I've known, you know? I mean, you know, what, but you know, what does the Bible say about her? She totally believed you can be a good person without God. She was a standard American liberal, you know? You can be a good person and a moral person without God. You don't need God. That's sin. That's outrageous, isn't it? To say that you can be a complete human being without God, that is the height of arrogance. I mean, I still love her, right? But we tell the truth. That is sin. That's the fundamental sin, says Paul. So Paul cuts deep, doesn't he? Sin isn't just actions. The actions flow. So he immediately brings up same-sex marriage, which we're not going to talk about in here. Not same-sex marriage, same-sex sin. And, and he brings it up because it's... Uh, the natural thing for creatures is to worship the creator, right? If we were behaving the way we should. The natural thing for creatures is to have sex with the opposite sex. So same-sex relationships mirror the distortion that's happened in the world. We're not surprised same-sex sin is increasing. It's the symptom, right? It's the symptom. It's not, it's a, it, to focus on the symptom is a mistake. Well, I mean, we need to talk about the symptoms. But it's the symptom. The cause is idolatry. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, so we see, we see it increasing. What's happening more and more is people are forsaking the one true God. So that, that's Paul's argument. And of course, that's not just true. That's true of adultery. That's true of living together. That's true of lying. All those sins are symptoms. They're still sins. We need to say things about them, of course, of course. Paul says things about them. But we always recognize there's a symptom, and sometimes as Christians, we want to focus on the symptoms. So, um, of course, Paul talks about sin and the law as well, works of the law. I mean, that's the new perspective stuff. I'm not really here to talk about that. That, that would take a long time. I just want to say about justification and Paul, again, I could... You know, obviously, we could spend a ton of time on this. 
But um, I think justification is forensic uh, in the traditional view. Um, so maybe that's all I'll say. I might, I might come back to it in a moment. We just see that we see Paul's view of uh, sin. I'm talking more about sin here. Uh, sin, is a, sin isn't just action, but sin is a power. Sin and death are two powers in Paul. They're like a po So here's the apocalyptic view of Paul out there. Fits with the kingdom, right? The apocalyptic Paul, there's those who emphasize apocalyptic, I think they overdo it. But there is, there's this apocalyptic theme in Paul. Sin and death are like two powers, two towers, right? The rule, the rule over human beings. So, so, so the law, see, the Jews are saying, how, how can we bring about the blessing of Genesis 3.15, the blessing promised to Abraham? If we can just keep the Torah, right? We can just keep the law. Paul's argument is, Sin, sin is like a sun that draws the law into its orbit. The law is a fine planet <laughs> out there. There's nothing wrong with it. But sin is so powerful, it, it takes something good into its orbit and it subverts it so that people end up uh, sinning instead of doing uh, what's right. Therefore, therefore, says Paul, the law is not the answer. You know, all liberals, liberal Christians, I mean, all liberal Christians, they're all Judaizers. They're, they all believe in the law, every one of them. Not God's law necessarily, but some law. We can have a just, peaceful society if we just educate people. We can just teach them right and wrong. We can, if we can just educate them, you know, education, education's good, right? Teaching right and wrong can be of some help. But what Paul goes deeper. At the root of the human heart, there's something fiercely resisting, resistant to God. So Romans 7, what happens, Romans 7, 7 through 11, the law produces a desire to sin. It's not the answer at the end of the day. The answer isn't education. The answer is the gospel. Fundamentalism. Fundamentalism, when it strays from the gospel, not all fundamentalists do stray from the gospel, but fundamentalism is if we can just give people rules, right? Here's the rules. Keep the rules. You'll be safe, you know? It's the same thing when fundamentalism goes astray. We're all prone to this, aren't we? When fundamentalism goes astray, it loses the gospel, doesn't it? It says the rules, and it often becomes subverted. The rules are what are going to keep everything in line. But the rules can't work at the end of the day. That, uh, Paul's not saying we don't need laws. We don't need commands. But he's saying it's not the answer. The Jews believe the law is the answer. Everybody in the world, except for those who hold the gospel, whether it's Muslims, Hindus, it's, it's always the same. It shows up in different ways, right? It's always the same answer. It's the rules. It's the law. And Paul says it won't work. It won't work because the cancer that is at the heart of human beings. So, you know, I'm going fast here, but we're we're, the, 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 we're, we, we're very, very, we're dead in trespass, trespasses and sin, right? So those who, are, who aren't of the Spirit don't welcome the things of the Spirit. They, they delight in unrighteousness. This is the apocalyptic view of Paul, right? There's two kingdoms. They're held captive by Satan. Um, it's, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil, reigning and ruling over human beings. So it's uh, human beings are in the flesh, and in the technical sense of the word, they're still in Adam. They're still in Adam, and they're not in Christ. So, you know, you think of, you think of, uh, you think of Romans 5. All people enter into the world condemned before God, guilty and spiritually dead, and headed towards physical death. Isn't that amazing? All people enter into the world guilty before God, condemned, and spiritually dead. Original sin. Um, Bernard Ram wrote a book, which I never read, and Ram's a little bit squishy, sometimes a lot squishy. But I like the title of the book. 
offense to reason on original sin. Hmm. Right? I mean, what do, what do people say? Hey, that's not fair. I want to come in the world just like Adam, poised between good and evil. I don't want to come in the world spring-loaded to sin. <laughs> uh, it's an offense to reason, right? You come into the world, I come into the world spring-loaded to sin. G.K. Chesterton said the doctrine of original sin is the most empirically verifiable of all Christian doctrines. It's true, right? You may disagree with it, but look at the kids. You know, we, our grandkids are wonderful. You know, the second grandkid of our second child, they, after Diane's accident, they lived with us and she was one and she'd just sit on the rug and do nothing. And I said, you know what? I'm beginning to doubt my doctrine of original sin. I was kidding, right? But she was so good. But guess what? She's five now and I've seen it. She's still as sweet as ever. Oh, so lovable. But hey, Ask her parents. She's a sinner. She has got a strong little will. She'll be as sweet as can be. And then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. So they didn't have to teach her that, did they? It's there. And guess what? She got it from her parents. <laughs> and uh, that we recognize that as parents. That's our story, too. And by the way, I think that's the point. The human race is an organic unity. You know, people say, I want to start each person over. That's not the way God constituted life. What a strange life it would be if we're not related to the whole human family. And, uh, and of course, you know, here you don't struggle with this, but the importance of uh, believing in the historical Adam, that's a huge deal today, isn't it? Don't compromise on that. That is, that is really fundamental. And, uh, you know, one thing I like to say to people who are a little more liberal, hey, that could open up the door to racism, right? <laughs> hey, there's different, there's different, and, and, our, and our group's better, and yours is worse. But we're one human race. We're one human race. We're all together in this.